Hi, I'm Amanda Krugliak. I'm the arts curator at the Institute for the Humanities Gallery. It's really great to visit with you today. The Institute for the Humanities Gallery is this amazing place where we think about how artists and art might affect social change. Right now, we're working on this incredibly ambitious multi-venue project with renowned Ghanaian artist Ibrahim Mahama. It's called In Between the World and Dreams. Usually, I would invite you to come visit me directly in the gallery, but because of COVID-19, we've had to think about things a little differently, and we're in a virtual space. In a different way, though, it allows us to move more freely beyond the four walls of the gallery, and we can really do some traveling. The first place I'd love to take you to is the University of Michigan Museum of Art, one of our installation sites. So here we are at UMA, the University of Michigan Museum of Art. We're in the middle of installation week of In Between the World and Dreams, Ibrahim's exhibition on the museum. It's a public installation on campus. I have to tell you, it's really a miracle that it happened at all with all of the challenges that faced us in getting this to move forward from engineering and permits and all the details. It's really something. It's first required an extensive build out on the roof to make it safe and secure. And now each of these panels will be sewn to one another to cover the facade of the Sand Gallery. This is the kind of work that Ibrahim is best known for, shrouding buildings all over the globe. The full title of this work is In Between the World and Dreams, 2012 to 2020. Mahama uses materials from all of the important works over the past 10 years of his career. He incorporates them into this extensive installation. In that sense, the piece is actually a retrospective for the artist. What's also really special about this exhibition is that it represents the first exterior installation of Bahama's work in the United States to date. Although he has shown work in galleries and inside of museums, this is the first time that we really get to see his signature drape of public buildings. Ibrahim Mahama's installations are made from hundreds of jute sacks. The jute sacks are synonymous with trade in Ghana because they originally are used to carry cocoa beans. And Ghana is one of the top producers of cocoa beans in the world. Later, they're repurposed to contain other commodities and transport them. Ultimately, they tie into the whole notion of labor how we value labor, the exploitation of labor, what it requires for all of these complex systems. They're about capitalism, globalism, global exchange, all rolled into one. I'd really like for you to get a closer look at the surface of the jute sacks, just so you could get an idea about how complicated the materiality is. But in order to do that, I really think we should go to another location where we did the preparation for the work. So we're back at the Institute for the Humanities in the atrium by the gallery. And this is where we've been storing all of the materials for the project and also preparing them for the various installations. As part of this project, we've been handling what are literally hundreds of pounds of material. And because we're in the middle of COVID-19, you know, typically we would have a lot of people to work on this with us. But because of the circumstances, we had to really be strategic and inventive and think about how could we work together at a distance, only a very few of us? How could we make this work? Sewing in the atrium rather than a larger building with crowds of people sometimes being able to work outside, but sometimes not. So that adjustment was a surprise about the project, 
Uh, but we responded to that in the moment. And the fabric tells you a lot about the nature of Ibrahim's work. It's almost a metaphor for this difficult journey, for the labor, for the burden, for the pride in one's labor. It's a humble fabric rather than something grandiose. Fabric can be a vessel for history. And that could be difficult histories like colonialism and slavery, but also uh, uh, for memories of people or loves or the kind of dress somebody wore, that, that all of that can be held within the hand of the fabric. This is rough, it's difficult, it's enduring, it's covered with marks and stains and variations, each of which becomes an imprint of the people who have handled the jute sacks. And then as we come to it, thinking of an art installation, our hands, our labor, our sewing becomes another layer in this ongoing process. We're really interconnected. And I think that's what's so incredibly beautiful about Ibrahim Mahama's work and these uh, textiles is they become almost a map of the world, the way that each of us is interwoven, interconnected, while at the same time making our own imprint. As Ibrahim Mahama's materials drape the institutional building, it really creates a, a living memorial, not a static monument to past histories, but acknowledging how things fail, fall apart, and what is the opportunity in moments of crisis to create entirely new systems together. It's as much about the failures of systems and false promises as it also is about building futures and new worlds. Notice all the stitching on the bags and the way that the bags piece together. The fact that they represent hours of labor from all different communities, from Ghana and from Ann Arbor. The way they're in a, a state of unraveling, falling apart, coming undone. In contrast, really, to the perfect, pristine surfaces of institutional buildings. It wouldn't surprise me if some of you might think about the artist Christo when you look at Ibrahim Mahama's work. But in many respects, they are on completely opposite sides of the spectrum, aesthetically. Christo's work comes from a Western perspective. It, it feels more about spectacle. It embraces a certain whimsical quality even, and perhaps is also about being an individualist. I think that Mahama's work is about community, not the individual. It embraces every day uh, the collective and uh, understanding the honor in all of that, as opposed to putting on a show. Taking on a project like this, in a time like this historically, facing all the challenges of COVID-19 and what that means, it really resonates in a different way. Inside spaces are limited. Our ability to go into museums, to have cultural experiences and exchanges, new perspectives. So this is a way to bring art into the public and hopefully give something back in a very public way. We have another very different installation of Ibrahim Mahama's work on campus, and I want to take you there now. This is the Institute for the Humanities Gallery. 
I like to think of it as this small room with really big ideas. As part of our project, the gallery functions as this portal. It transports us back to Tamale, Ghana, where the artist lives and works. It's immersive. You really feel like you're part of this whole process. The fabric is very visceral, and, and you become part of the story. What's interesting is the way that the fabric becomes this trace or artifact for all the people who have handled the material and become part of this. Bahamas practice also seems to reflect this same way that we trade and things move from one country to another. All of the materials required to do these installations travel from one place to another place, are borrowed, are stored. Just to do this installation at the university, we have worked with people in Italy and also Vancouver and Toronto and Los Angeles. So the whole project functions kind of in the same way that the cocoa bags do. The gallery is really making the connection also to place. On the walls of the gallery are two large scale photographs that show you his hometown and the Savannah Center for the Arts that he's built there. Ibrahim is this visionary. He carries around a notebook where he draws images of the future, things he wants to build. And these photographs indicate that. Classrooms out of abandoned airplanes that he purchases, or a pool that he builds where children can play and think of new ways of being and seeing in the world. Ibrahim Mahama is an artist who's deeply committed to his community. It's a really important part of his practice. He's definitely well known and he's shown all over the world at the Venice Biennale and Sydney Biennial and Documenta. But really it's the collaboration with his own community. The fact that he employs people at home to help make these works that is most critical for him. Oftentimes, work by African artists just lands back in collections uh, and for the experience of those in the West. Ibrahim Mahama really wants to ensure that cultural opportunities that we experience are also experienced by those in his own country with his own people. There's one more remarkable thing that I want to show you about this exhibition. But the best view is actually outside. Follow me. Because the gallery isn't open to the public due to COVID-19, we've decided to offer the whole exhibition for you to view from the outside. Come a little closer. You can hear the video and see the whole exhibition. So this is the, uh, I think the first building that was erected. Yes, exactly. We are currently in Tamale, where we have SCCA Tamale, a contemporary art institution, which we founded in 2019 for showing uh, modern arts, at least uh, uh, paintings from the Ghanaian modernist era. Um, a couple of years ago, we also started working on an institution called Red Clay which is um, an artist studio, which is meant for experimentation and also like a knowledge site. Um, it's supposed to do many things rather than just being an artist studio where objects are produced. So today we are just here to present the studio to you. With me here, we have uh, Selam Kuji, who is the artistic director of SCCA. Uh, he will introduce the team and um, we will just take a walk through the studio and then also the, the landscape. This is Esnam Tamali. She's our general manager, our PA, and our PR. Our Wonder Woman. Our Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she does so many things in, uh, over here, and then she helps a lot. And then we have uh, uh, an executive. He's our national service personnel, and also our main librarian. 
and uh, archivist. Archivist. Yeah. The idea was just to have a studio space where we could make work um, as artists, but eventually we decided that we we're going to convert it into like an institution. Um, so it could it could either be used as a space for making art work or a place for showing work. So this is uh, an extension of uh, the original part of the studio. Uh, currently we are just saving materials here, airplane seats from the airplanes that I collected, which will be used in building these cinemas that I've been designing. We have cement bags, which are going to be used as part of the materials in the Parliament of Ghosts, which are currently working on. We have uh, the original railway slippers, which was used in the building of a railway by the British in the late 19th century. We have lanterns, uh, cabinets, and a lot of other things. Um, this room is going to be used as a space for keeping archives, photographs, and also we're going to have a photographic studio as part of this uh, space. Um, we're currently walking through the corridor that leads to the Parliament of Ghosts. I like the way it's somehow with the scaffold and it almost acts as if you're walking through this forest. The Parliament of Ghosts was originally conceived as a theatrical space, something which I had wanted to design for the studio to, in order to allow members of the community and all the villages to come together to be able to have meetings, discussions, and also to be able to watch films together. So it acts as a central space to the entire institution. So we're going to be having lectures, uh, seminars, film screenings, and a lot of different activities right here. So it's not just um, a studio which the artist is going to use for the uh, making of objects, but it's also going to be a place which is going to be used for rethinking and reshaping history and also the cultural norms and values within the, within the space and community. So the Parliament of Ghosts allows the audience or the people within the community to rethink about the histories which they possess and how they function within it. Labor is very essential to whatever we are doing. So we focus a lot on it. The people who help us to build, I think it's very important for us to think about that in relation to what the idea of any institution can be because we tend to focus so much on what we want to do and we pay very little attention to those who actually build these things. So within this uh, pandemic period, I think it's very important that it allows us to reflect on the conditions that we've created in the world and how we can use the, the paradoxes of capital somehow to be able to bring new life back into the world and the society around us because once we are able to have infrastructure it goes a long way to also reshift or reshape reshape the imagination of uh, practitioners within a space or a community the whole studio complex was designed with children in mind the idea is to be able to create an environment that allows them to be able to think freely and move around freely um, the parliament is supposed to tie all of this thing all of this together at least to be able to push their imagination and be able to give them a voice um, using the carcass and the decay of history as a starting point for future conversations Hello, Ibrahim. How are Hello. you? Hello. I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. It's so good to see you after all this time. <laughs> Ibrahim, I just wanted to ask you a couple questions that we can share with students here at the university. Okay. Okay? Yes. So how are you doing in this moment? I'm doing well, actually. I think I'm doing more well now than I have before the pandemic. Um, because being stuck in one place has really helped me to somehow 
evolve a lot of the ideas that I've been working on. So I'm really kind of grateful for it. And I've also been eating well because I realized that when I travel around the world, I'm not able to eat properly because my stomach is somehow used to the food that I eat. <laughs> so I think I've gained some weight on my cheeks and, <laughs> and I'm, happy. <laughs> I'm happy about it. I feel, I feel healthy, which is good. Good. Do you feel like your practice is means something different to you now in this moment or uh, your work as an artist? Does it, does it feel as if it's doing something different? Yes, absolutely. I think so. Just being home now has made yeah. me realize that maybe a lot of the, my work is maybe trying to say something that for many years I could just never find a piece to hear it. But right. now that I'm just I have to be, I'm confronted by the spaces that inspires the work constantly every day. So it allows for the ideas to evolve a lot more. And I feel that I'm a much, I'm, I'm a different, a much better artist than I was before the pandemic. Huh? That's so interesting how place or, or being in one place, standing still, as opposed to the haste of moving around and the, the impact that that has. Um, yes. I've read also recently remarks that you've made about what this moment might offer where things have come apart or the conjuring up of ghosts from our troubled histories, you know, what yeah. that moment rep represents. Could you talk more about that? Uh, well, um, one of the ideas that I've always worked with was what residues could uh, pr uh, somehow produce. Um, beyond just the state in which they are, just beyond the aesthetic state or beyond the, the idea of the symbolic. So trying to use materials and objects which have been somehow, which have lived different lives in uh, history, and now that they occupy the current state that they are in within the aesthetical form, what else, what purpose could they serve? So in the state of the jute sacks, I was trying to understand the idea of the memories and residues embedded within this and understanding that the art world through commodification and all that, when these objects then now become artworks, they have different ways in which they operate. So an object which would have been thrown into a dustbin suddenly can be worth uh, $50,000 as an artwork. And what happens when what happens when that becomes $50,000? Is it po possible that that uh, the residue, the new residue, which is money or capital, can then yeah. now go back into some of these spaces that produce those aesthetics to somehow re-channel them in a different direction? Not to further privatize and capitalize on it, but somehow to, re to bring it back into the public domain. Now that it's, uh, it is in that state, it gives us a renewed way of looking at it. And I think that when failure happens, it only gives us the opportunity to somehow relook at the world much more closer. And I'm more interested in the, the idea of the looking at things more closer through these uh, through these aesthetical forms. It's interesting to me that you know the very hand of the fabric, this burlap, just inherent to the burlap, uh, is a, a roughness or the quality evokes a visceral response. Um, I'm so struck by how powerful the material is, which I wouldn't have expected in quite the same way. Um, another part of your practice that's so significant is how you embed community really into your process and how you think of your practice as a social practice that engages community and values community. So can you, can you also discuss that a bit? how community plays into the work that you do and your feelings regarding your responsibilities to community? Um, well, my training in art school, the, the basis of community was the, the, was at the, that was at the core of my training in art school, that how do we practice art in an age where art is constantly becoming more capitalized on and where art is becoming more elitist in a sense. So how do we create art that somehow becomes a gift to the community and to the society? I think that is very important. Uh, when I'm making work, I'm always trying as much as possible to think about how I can bring people into the production of the work 
and also at this, by, whilst considering the very conditions of those uh, individuals and people as part of their work in itself. So it's not just about making a painting which uh, by the hand of the genius artist ends up in a museum somewhere, but it's also the act of having to produce something and also the political conditions around that. How are people involved in the, the production of this this new system and how we are looking at it? I think in the end of the day, it's all about just the idea of uh, equality and uh, further emancipation. How can we create spaces that allow for more inclusion in terms of experiencing and also for taking responsibility regarding production? One thing that uh, came to mind too, as we've been working with the project, Ibrahim, is that we become part of yes. this exchange too, right? So that every time this work is then shown somewhere else or uh, engages another community, even sourcing out the materials from British Columbia, which came from Toronto or LA or wherever they came from, that there was a way that the, the work itself was this cultural exchange where we become part of this ongoing exchange and the responsibilities towards it. And, and that was a, you know, that was the piece of this I hadn't really considered too before I became part of that exchange. So it's been great. It's important. Yeah. yeah. It's important because things are constantly moving around the world. So I think it's important for us to really take time to reflect upon them. But what the Jute Sack does is that it allows us a moment of, quiet to reflect upon the uh, the implications of the material through its aesthetics and also through the gesture of covering, let's say, an object or a building or something like that. Absolutely. Well, we're so happy that we got to see you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that at least we can provide some material which is good context for the students in this project take care thank you <laughs> okay <laughs>